I've got most of the answers coming through here. Okay, let's show you what you've got there. Okay, so looking pretty good. Um, on the bright side, we've got lots of correct answers here. So if you have a look at the PA view versus the AP view, the first thing you're going to see is that that cardiac shadow is a lot wider, a lot larger in the AP view. So that's gonna be important when we look at cardiothoracic ratio a little bit later. And you're 100% right, the lung fields are definitely better visualized in the PA view. If you have a look at the difference between the two x-rays, the PA view, you're able to see what's going on in those lung fields a whole lot better than on the AP view. So that's really important and really useful. It means that when you're commenting on the cardiothoracic ratio in the AP view, you've got to be aware that that makes it really difficult to comment on. So when you say, is the cardiothoracic ratio enlarged? On the AP view, you can't really comment. So think about that in the back of your mind. Okay, right. Then the next thing you want to know is, is this x-ray adequate or not? Um, is it underpenetrated or is it overpenetrated? So here we go. Stop sharing. And you get to answer the next question. Is this x-ray underexposed or overexposed? I'm getting most of the correct answers coming through here. This is very promising. So with underexposed, when you have a look at the x-ray, ideally on an x-ray, you want to be able to have a look at the vertebral bodies and you want to be able to see the vertebral bodies roughly down to the level of the carina, so roughly T4. If you can see all of the vert vertebral bodies, then you've got a pretty good x-ray. If you're underexposed, you're not gonna see those vertebrae. So let's have a look at this one. This is roughly T4, where that red line is. And as you have a look at it, you really can't see those vertebral bodies well at all. So on this x-ray, I would say this is probably underexposed. It's a little bit too white. It's just not quite what you're looking for. And let's show you the opposite. This is an example of an x-ray that's completely overexposed. So as you have a look at it, you can see it's just far too dark to really see much that's useful at all. Um, so when you have a look at that, you want to be aware of what's underexposed and what's overexposed. Okay. Next question, um, is the patient rotated? So when you have a look at the screen, is the patient standing straight on or have they moved a little bit one way or another? And has the x-ray been taken with a bit of rotation? So let's have a look at this one here. And do you think that's rotated or not? What you want to have a look at on the x-ray, you can see that you've got clavicles. And as you look at the clavicles, you want to see that in terms of where they are from the sternum, you want them to be the same distance from the sternum. So if you look at this x-ray and you look at the clavicles, and I'll try and point them out to you here, do they look like they're the same distance from the sternum? Yes or no? And this is what you want it to be. This is a pretty good x-ray where both of your clavicles are roughly the same distance from the sternum. But if you have a look at that first x-ray again and you see where those clavicles are, this definitely looks like the patient's rotated, which means that your cardiac silhouette is going to be on what looks like almost the wrong side of the, of the x-ray. And it means that it's very difficult to comment because your patient's just turned a little bit. Purely as an aside, what do you think's going on with that bright white thing? What is the white thing on the right-hand side of the chest? I've put in, I have absolutely no idea, so that you have an option if you've got absolutely no clue what's going on.
got a question coming through on the chat, which says, can we use the spinous processes and which way it's facing the clavicles to determine rotation as well? If your patient isn't rotated, you're going to find that the clavicles are all gonna lie, oh, the spinous processes should all line up down the middle. If you find that the spinous processes start kind of deviating off to the one side, then you're going to know that you've got an element of rotation going on there. So yes, you're right. You can keep an eye on the spinous processes as well. Okay, so most people have got that one right. Let me close this one and show you what answer we've got there. I like that some people have admitted that they've got absolutely no idea what's going on. It's, it's never a bad thing to admit that you have no idea what's going on. Um, let me just stop sharing, there we go. Um, so what you've got there, if you have a look at it, you can see that you've got white thing on the right hand side of the chest. And look, it's got a wire that comes off it that seems to go through into the heart. So that's a typical example of a pacemaker. And I brought it up just because it's interesting. No other reason than that. Um, just nice to know what's going on with that x-ray. But it's a really good example of a rotated x-ray. Okay, so back to our talk. The next thing you want to have a look at is, have you got a really nice, good inspiratory film? Have you taken a deep enough breath that you can see really nice, adequate lung fields? And you've got an example here of an x-ray that really isn't too great. If you count down those ribs, really conveniently, I've put the answer on there for you. How many ribs can you see? And you can see roughly six ribs. So it's not a great inspiratory film. What you really want your patient to do is to take a nice deep breath in, hold the breath in while you're taking the x-ray, and then ideally you should have a really good inspiratory film and you want to see at least nine ribs. And you've got an example here of a good 10 ribs. Um, so this would be a lovely, adequate x-ray. So we've chatted a little bit about, is it the right patient? Is it the right day? Is it an AP or a PA view? Um, is it underexposed? Is it overexposed? Have you got a really nice, adequate view? And is it rotated or not? Okay, so that's the basics that you want to have a look at. What you want to do next, once you've decided that your x-ray is a decent enough x-ray to look at, is you want to know what's going on with it. And with everything in emergency medicine, we want to make it as easy as possible. So we're going to have an A, B, C, D, E approach. I couldn't find something for F. If you can think up a good answer for F, please pop that in the chat. But let's go through the basics for A, B, C, D, E. Um, what we've got, okay, I've got a question coming through on the chat saying, is it not hyperinflation if you see more ribs? So let's go back and have a quick look at it. Here we go. You want to see at least nine ribs, 10 ribs you're happy with. And you're right. By the time you've got your diaphragms that look like they've been pushed right down, they're really flat, and you can see 11 or 12 ribs, then you know that your patient is hyperinflated. And that's going to tie in with a typical patient who's known with underlying COPD. So that's a very good point. Look out for a patient that hasn't got a good enough inspiratory film and your patient who is hyperinflated and you've got diaphragms that are really flattened down and you can see all the way down below your ninth and 10th rib. Okay, so back to having a quick look at what you're looking like, at, what you're looking at on your chest X-ray and you're looking for an ABCDE approach. So in terms of basics, what you're looking at initially is airway and you want to have a look at your trachea. Is your trachea central or not? Next thing you want to have a look at um, is whether or not your lung fields are nice and clear. So you want to have a look at B for breathing and have a look at the lungs. Moving on from B, next thing you're looking at is C. So that would be your circulation. And that's your cardiothoracic ratio. Does your heart look normal? Is your cardiothoracic ratio enlarged? Is it the normal size? Anything abnormal you can see with the heart. D for diaphragms. So do the diaphragms look nice and clear? Can you clearly see them on both sides? Is there any air underneath the diaphragm? Is maybe the diaphragmatic, um, or, or maybe your, your, is your diaphragm obscured by something in the way, potentially some fluid or potentially underlying lower respiratory tract infection? And then E for anything extra. Anything else you want to be having a look at that you want to be aware of on this x-ray. So let's have a look at some basic examples here. First thing you want to have a look at is, is the trachea central? Or is it pushed off towards the left or the right? Or is it, let me rephrase that, is it moved off towards the left or the right? And then the important thing to remember in terms of the trachea moving is that the trachea could be pushed or the trachea could be pulled. So 
both of those are really important to try and differentiate. So you've got an example here of a trachea that's definitely deviated. If you have a look, that trachea is definitely deviated towards the left. The question is, is it pushed or is it pulled? So you get to vote on this one as well. Let me bring this up here. Trachea pushed or pulled? At the moment, we are literally 50-50 for pushed and pulled. We need a couple of extra votes, so we have a deciding factor here. We're still 50-50. On the bright side, 50% of you would pass. Okay, let me stop you there. We are literally neck and neck on this one. So I'll have to talk you through it. We've got 47% of votes for pushed, 53 for pulled. If you have a look at this x-ray, um, the next question will, will help answer what's going on here. It's definitely moved across towards the left, but what's doing that and what's going on? Can you see on the right-hand side, there's something really odd going on here as well. So let's ask that question and then we'll talk through the extra. What is, what is going on and what's moving the track here to the left? I feel like I've just given you the answer. Is it pushed or pulled? I've got all the answers coming through correct so far. Almost all of the answers coming through correct. Okay, let me stop you there. We've got most people getting exactly the right answer there. If you have a look on the right hand side, so on the right lung, it looks like that whole right lung has collapsed down. And you've got a great example there of what a pneumothorax looks like. So your lungs completely collapsed down on the right hand side. Between your lung and your chest wall, you've got a whole pile of free air. And that free air is then pushing the trachea over to the left hand side. So this is a great example of your trachea not being central, it's being pushed towards the left, and it's being pushed over by that pneumothorax. Um, I don't, I actually, so just check with me here, and I just want to, like, if you can put a hand up and answer. If I'm moving my mouse, can you see where my mouse is? If someone can just reply in the chat and just let me know if you can see my mouse. Yes, fantastic, great, okay. Um, so, oh, sorry, let me go back. Here we go. Um, on this one, if you have a look at the track here, you can see the track here is basically over here. So central, you'd want central to be right up and down, and you can see that this is just pulled over towards the left-hand side here. Let me give you an example of the next one, which will make it a little bit clearer as well. Here's your track here. Can you see that that trachea has moved? And you can see that that trachea is definitely deviated towards the right. 
Um, so what we've got on this side is an example of a trachea that again is deviated, and this time it's pulled. So we'll go back to the first one, have a quick look at the first one, and then I'll show you this one again. Here your trachea is moved towards the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you can see that you've got your lung that's completely collapsed down, and here's your lung. I'm showing you with my mouse and outlining where the lung is. Can you see between the lung and the chest wall cavity, this whole area here, you've got an area of really hypoechoic, basically a blackened area, and you've got no lung markings in that area. So this area here is your pneumothorax. And because you've got air trapped inside your lung cavity, pushing the right lung down, and then pushing your trachea over towards the left. You've got an example here of the trachea deviating towards the left and it's being pushed by that free air. The next one we've got here is an example of the trachea that's deviated towards the right-hand side, except this time, if you have a look at it, you can see that in the right upper zones, you've got an area that looks like you've got some fibrosis up there. So with fibrosis, instead of having nice big aerated tissue, you find that your lung tends to collapse down. And as it collapses down with fibrosis and often a bit of scarring, it's gonna pull the trachea with it all the way over to the right. So you've got some tracheal deviation on this side over to the right as well. Let me have a quick look in the chats and see if I've answered all the questions. So uh, a pull tends to occur usually with fibrosis. Um, the things that tend to push the lung often are a pulmonary effusion, so free fluid, a hemothorax, a pneumothorax, that tends to push the trachea, pulling tends to be fibrosis and scarring collapse down of that area. Okay, so that's your A, basics of A. Next thing you want to have a look at is breathing and your lung fields, hence the picture of fields. So when you're looking at your lung fields, you want to have a look and work out what's going on. This is one of the x-rays from Helen Joseph. And as you have a look at it, if you look at your lung fields, you can see that your right lung field looks pretty good. You've got nice normal lung tissue there, but have a look and see what's going on in your left lower zones. There looks like there's some increased opacification there, like some hazy cotton wool type of opacification. Um, so it would be interesting to know what's going on in that lung field. I'm just gonna see uh, if I've got a poll for this one, bear with me. Okay, next one I've got a poll. So, um, if we go back to this one, you can have a look and see that there's an area of infiltrate in the left lower zones. Difficult to know what that is. It definitely looks like there's some consolidation there. Looking at that, I think you've probably got some infective changes in your left lower zones. Let's compare it and have a look at the next x-ray that you've got coming up. So on this x-ray, you've definitely got something going on in the lung fields. Let's ask you what you think it is. What can you see on this x-ray? And you get to answer multiple answers here.
Okay, let's have a look at some of those answers. Okay, so what can you see on this chest x-ray? Trachea central? Yep, I would agree. Trachea definitely looks nice and central there, which is great. Um, next question. Oh, I'm, I need to move this so I can see what's going on. Um, can you see some infiltrates? And it definitely looks like there's some infiltrates, but it doesn't look like they're everywhere. If you have a look at it, you've got some infiltrates in kind of the right mid zones, maybe a little bit in the right lower zones, definitely the left mid zones, and definitely the left lower zones. And it's really interesting because that infiltrate on the left hand side actually looks quite nice and round. It looks like it's got a shape to it. It doesn't just look like it's, it's spread out. And that's interesting because that makes you wonder, could that infiltrate maybe be a mass in that area? And if you're thinking that it's a mass, is it possibility that it might be something non-benign? So that's interesting. And then can you see the heart borders nicely? Not really. So really difficult on the left-hand side to see that heart border nicely. So whatever's going on in the lung field is obscuring that. Diaphragms don't look too bad. I can't see the right costophrenic angle really nicely. Um, it looks like there's some infiltrates there, so that makes that a little bit difficult. Um, left, left lung field doesn't look too bad. Let me just close this down so I can have a good look. So you can see the costophrenic angle over here all right. This one's a little bit difficult. It looks like there's some infiltrates in the way there. And then in terms of just everything else you're looking at, it looks like you've got a couple of bra straps going on here and you've definitely got a female patient. Um, not relevant for this patient, but always interesting to have a look and see, is there something else on the x-ray I'm missing? So if this patient came into the emergency department and this was one of our patients at Helen and I saw this x-ray, I would be really worried. The first thing I'm thinking for this x-ray is, is there some sort of a non-benign mass going on there? And if that's a mass, that quite nice round lesion on the left-hand side, could those little lesions on the right-hand side, could those potentially be mets? So this x-ray has got me really worried. What I would like to do for this patient would be to admit the patient and I'd like a CT scan so I can work out exactly what's going on with this patient. Um, what are we seeing on top of the gastric bubble? Um, okay, here, so is this what you're looking at? These kind of artifacts over here? Yes, okay. Um, that looks like the back of a bra strap. That looks like we connect those at the back. So it looks like you've got bra straps over here and I think that that's just a strap that goes around the back. Um, ideally, you want your patient obviously to be standing up a proper PA view. You want them to have a gown on, not have a bra on, which makes me think that this was probably done as an AP and probably done in the emergency department um, for a sick patient sitting up in bed. Because often if we have sick patients, we tend to not get them up, we don't mobilize them, we don't undress them properly. We should, but often we don't. So I think that's probably what's going on with this patient. Okay, next question. What can you see going on here? So let me bring this one up as well. What is going on here?
Okay, let me talk you through what we've got here. I'm going to share with you what we've got, and then we'll talk through it bit by bit. So is the track here central? Yep, I'm definitely happier that the track here is central. Let me just close down the poll so I can bring up my picture. Okay, so track here looks good. Um, what can you see on those lung fields? And it's actually really interesting. If you have a look on the left-hand side, it definitely looks like you've got some infiltrates down in what would be the right lower zones. And it looks like, can you see that quite bright white line? That looks like you've got some fibrosis that's kind of holding that part of the lung through to the side wall. But wait, this is quite exciting. If you have a look, can you see this white line over here? This looks like you've got a pneumothorax on this side and it looks like that whole right lung has collapsed down. We'll try and bring up that nice line. Here we go. That's your pneumothorax line. So you've definitely got a pneumothorax on the right. You can see out towards the peripheral sides, you've got no lung markings over here. You do have some lung markings in the middle, but then you've got fibrosis right down at the bottom. So I wonder if this patient has had previous TB and has got old fibrotic changes down the bottom and then a pneumothorax probably from that TB. You've got some infiltrates on the right hand side as well. And this x-ray, it's really not too clear what's going on because I'm worried about this line over here on the right, on the left hand side. I'm worried that this patient's got a pneumothorax on the left as well, which would be really unlucky for this patient. Um, I'd like to have a slightly better quality x-ray just to confirm what I think is going on on the left because I'm not 100% sure there. Cardiothoracic ratio looks great. Diaphragms look great. You can see those nice and clearly. And only about half of you wanted, were really excited to put in a chest drain. I can't wait to put in a chest drain on this patient. This is going to be a lovely patient to put in a chest drain on the right-hand side. The only thing to think about when you put in the chest drain is you want to make sure you're putting it in high enough because you obviously don't want to get your drain right down here where there's an element of fibrosis. But the fact that this lung has collapsed down so much, the moment you get in that drain, your lung should then start to re-expand again. Okay, next x-ray. Um, what is going on here? Purely out of interest, can everyone else hear the background chaos that's going on? It sounds like there's a psych patient outside my office door swearing loudly. Can anyone else hear that or is it just me? <laughs> no, everyone can hear. I'm really sorry. Welcome to Helen Joseph where there'll always be a psych patient. Thanks, Elzette. I'm not the psych patient yet. So as an interesting story, when I was busy specializing in emergency medicine and I did my final exams, I was working in Peter Maritzburg at the time as a registrar and the exams were up here in Joburg. So I came up, had the exams and they were here in Helen Joseph Hospital for the practicals. And my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, brought me through to the hospital because he lived in Joburg and he waited outside while I was inside doing the exam. And in the middle of my exam, apparently a psych patient ran out of the hospital and started running around the car park, causing absolute mayhem and chaos, with three or four security guards running after him, tackling him to the ground until they could bring him back inside. So the good news is I passed my exams. And then six months later, Paul and I needed to decide were we both going to move down to KZN, where I was, or was I going to move up to Joburg, where he was? 
and we decided that I was going to move up to Joburg. Um, but I said to him, I think Helen Joseph's is probably going to be the best hospital to work at. And he was horrified because his only experience at the hospital was seeing a psych patient running around the car park, of, you know, followed by three or four security guards. And I think he was horrified this was where his future wife was going to be working. Okay, so let's end this and have a look. And it looks like most people have got the right results here. So let's talk you through what we've got. If you have a look at this, um, let me have a quick look. Yeah, there we go. Um, can you see in your right upper zones, you've got these areas here where you've kind of got circles. This looks like a bit of a circle here. You've got a bigger circle over here. There's definitely something going on and you've got infiltrates on both sides, but on the right hand side, it looks like you've got quite well circumscribed infiltrates. The left hand side just looks like a complete mess. The left hand side looks like you've probably got, uh, it could be a combination of fluid. Um, it could be infiltrates in that area, could be pleural thickening, really difficult to work out what's going on on the left hand side. But certainly on the right hand side, you've got definitely those quite well circumscribed round lesions. Those worry me. Those look like probably metastases. So I'm not sure if your primary malignancy is on the left-hand side um, with METs to the right, or if your primary malignancy is somewhere else, maybe abdominal, and you've got METs to the lung from that. Again, this patient I'd want to admit, I want to do a CT scan on and work out what's going on for this patient. Okay, so we've chatted a little bit about lung fields. The next thing we want to have a look at, so we've chatted about airway, trachea central, we've chatted about lung fields, then we want to have a look at C for cardiac. And is the cardiothoracic ratio the normal size or is it too big? And remember we said when you look at cardiothoracic ratios, you want to be looking in the PA view. If you've got an x-ray that's an AP view, it's really difficult to work out what's going on and you probably can't comment on it. So assuming you've got a PA view and you're looking from the back to the front, you want your cardiothoracic ratio to be less than 50% of your total um, lung volume. So if you have a look at the picture on the left-hand side of your screen, that's a nice normal cardiothoracic ratio. If you look at the picture on the right, you'll see that your uh, cardiac shadow is much bigger than the one on the left. And that looks like it's more than 50% overall. So something is going on with that heart. You can safely say it's an enlarged cardiothoracic ratio, and then you would need to search and work out exactly what's going on. So this is a pediatric chest X-ray from a child who's got a congenital heart abnormality. It's just a great example of the fact that that heart is massive. Um, definitely more than 50% of your total cardiac, uh, of your total thoracic ratio. So that's what you're looking at in terms of, is your cardiothoracic ratio enlarged? Okay, so A, B, C, next one's going to be D, and that's your diaphragm. When you have a look at the diaphragm, you want to have a look and see, is there something unusual below the diaphragm? Or is there something unusual above the diaphragm? So let's pull this one up. Um, here we go. Okay, which side should the stomach bubble be on? Should it be on the left or should it be on the right? This is where I'm expecting everyone to look at their own bellies and go, okay, where's my stomach, left or right? Thank goodness I've got everyone getting the correct answer. Okay, I don't need to put this one up. I've got most people getting the correct answer. One or two here were quite perfect. Um, in terms of where your stomach bubble should be, your stomach bubble should be on the left-hand side. So what you expect to see, um, just make sure I've stopped sharing. Yeah, there we go. Um, so what you should see is on your left-hand side, if you're going to have any gas at all, it should be over here. So the fact that on this X-ray, you can see that there's a bit of gas below your diaphragm on the right-hand side, that's worrying. That means that you've got air underneath your diaphragm on the right that shouldn't be there. On your right-hand side, you should have a liver and you shouldn't see any air at all. So this is an example of free air under the diaphragm. It's not the best x-ray, so I've got a slightly better version. On the left-hand side here, this is your stomach bubble. So this is normal, this you're happy with. 
But on your right hand side, can you see this area here underneath the diaphragm? Here's your diaphragm, this white line over here. And underneath it, you've got free air under the diaphragm. So this means that something in terms of a hollow viscous, so colon, small bowel, has perforated. And you've got free air that's sitting in the abdomen where it shouldn't be. So in terms of the diaphragm, you want to see what's below it. And is there something unusual below it? And then you want to have a look and see, is there something unusual above the diaphragm? So you've got a great example here on the right-hand side. You can see that you've got an area over here that's um, hyperechoic. You can't see the diaphragm nicely. You can see the diaphragm beautifully on the left. On the right-hand side, you can't see the diaphragm. And you don't really know what's going on here. So this could be a pleural effusion. It could be infiltrates, so some sort of a pneumonia that's obscuring the diaphragm. You can definitely say you can't see the diaphragm nice and clearly. So you're worried about this patient as well. So we chatted about airway, breathing, circulation, diaphragm, and then you want to have a look and see, is there something extra going on? Something else, aside from what we've already looked at, that you want to mention. So on this x-ray, trachea central, your lung fields are nice and clear, your cardiothoracic ratio is normal, your diaphragms are beautiful, but hang on, have a look at your right-hand side clavicle. And can you see that you've got a right clavicular fracture? So you want to have a look at all your bones and have a look and see what else is going on and is there something extra that you need to spot. Next example, you've got a patient who's come in, trachea looks central, lung fields look good, circulation looks good, your cardiothoracic ratio is normal, diaphragms look great. But there's something interesting here, you've got some ECG leads on. So this is a little bit odd, there's something going on, this patient's not well if they're on monitors. And then can you see this looks like there's some artifact here. And if you look nice and closely, this patient's lying on a spinal board. So I think this is probably a trauma patient um, that's lying on a spinal board. So you want to have a look and see, is there any sign of trauma somewhere? Interestingly, if you have a look down quite nicely here and you go through all the bones systematically, this x-ray is a little bit over-penetrated, over-exposed, because you can see your T-spinal all the way down. But if you have a look, can you see that your vertebrae here are all nice and nice and square? And this vertebra here has collapsed a bit. So if we know it's a trauma patient and your patient's on a spinal board, I'm worried about what trauma is going on with that vertebrae that's collapsed right down towards the bottom part of that x-ray. So make sure that you're looking at all the other aspects of the x-ray to make sure you don't miss anything. Okay, in terms of extras, I want to know what else is going on on this x-ray. What else can you see on this x-ray? So there's a question come through about the previous x-ray. If you suspect a spinal issue, would you prefer to do an overexposed x-ray? Yeah, 100%, because you want to have a look at the bones. Um, so you'll probably find that that previous x-ray was, I would say, overexposed on purpose. Um, overexposed if it was a chest x-ray. If you're looking at your T-spine, absolutely perfect.
Okay. So let's have a look at all the extra things that you can see on there. I'll share the results with you and we'll just talk through them. Okay, so what can you see? Um, on the right hand side, definitely some rib fractures. You can see these rib fractures over here. So definitely some rib fractures. Um, and very interesting, outside the lung fields, you can see this hypoechoic area, this black area that's outside the lung field, that's surgical emphysema, which makes you wonder whether or not there's a pneumothorax on that side, and I can't see it clearly. But if you've got surgical emphysema and you've got rib fractures, there's a good chance you've got an underlying pneumothorax on that right-hand side. Um, so rib fractures, definitely. Surgical emphysema, definitely. Interestingly, this patient's had previous surgery. You can see these wires over here. This looks like previous stenotomy scars. This patient's probably previously had cardiac bypass. I know that there's some oxygen tubing. Here we go. You can see the oxygen tubing running down here. A little bit of oxygen tubing as well. I can't see any ECG leads. And I'm surprised because this patient must be on monitors. If they've got a rib fracture and they've got surgical emphysema, I really hope someone puts this patient onto monitors nice and quickly. Can't see any obvious clavicle fractures. Clavicles look okay to me. Humerus looks all right. So the main, the main pathology here is going to be rib fractures and your surgical emphysema. And then just as extras to note the oxygen tubing and the previous genotomy scars. So interesting thing to look at in terms of all the extras. Oh, this one you can't really miss. What extra is going on there aside from all the ECG dots and the fact that there's probably an underwire bra, uh, you can't really miss the fact that the patient's been stabbed. It's unusual to have an x-ray like this. Usually it's blatantly obvious when you can see the patient, but you might want an AP and a lateral to work out exactly where your knife is. So you might end up seeing x-rays like this. Okay, so we've chatted about airway, breathing, circulation, diaphragm, all the extras. Now what we want to do is try and put it all together. So I've got three cases to run through and we'll just chat through them briefly. We've got a 36 year old male patient who's known with HIV. The patient comes into the emergency department with a five day history of a cough and he's short of breath. He's hypotensive, blood pressure 80 over 40. So you are worried about this patient. He's tachycardic, pulse rate 115, that's high. Respiratory rate is 25, so that's high as well. SATs, 86% on room air. You're definitely worried about what's going on with this patient. What can you see on this chest X-ray? Okay, let's talk through what we've got there. Let me show you what we've got. Let's talk through it bit by bit. Uh, hang on, stop share. Okay. Um, so trachea looks central, happy with that. That looks pretty good. Um, in terms of B for breathing, so lung fields, left-hand side looks pretty good. 
can't see anything obvious going on on the left. But on the right hand side, it looks like you've got some infiltrates in the mid zone. And really interesting, there's some darker areas within those infiltrates. Can you see those areas there? I wonder what that is. We'll come back to that in a sec. So definitely something going on in the right mid zone. Cardiothoracic ratio looks good. That's less than 50% of the total, of the total um, area. Diaphragms, those look pretty good. Left hand side looks nice and clear. Right hand side, I don't think there's a pleural effusion there. I think that looks okay. I'm happy with that. Um, extras, it looks like you might have had some ECG leads on before. You can see those two little dots, um, but no obvious cardiac monitors on there at the moment. So this patient, interestingly enough, oh, hang on, I think I actually have something which asks you what the diagnosis is. Oh, no, next one. No, I don't. Um, so this patient, um, interestingly enough, has got, an, has got an underlying pneumonia affecting the right mid zones more so than anything else. But this patient on blood culture ended up growing a Klebsiella pneumonia, which is a type of bacteria that produces gas. So inside that area of infection, you've got some gas production as well. And that's why you've got those little black areas inside the middle of the lung. Very interesting. Okay, next clinical case. Typical of what we're seeing at the moment. You've got a 78 year old patient who's known diabetic, known hypertensive, really obese patient. And this patient presents with a 10 day history of cough, shortness of breath, intermittent fevers. Blood pressure is borderline low, 96 over 65. I'm a bit worried about that. And a little bit tachycardic, pulse 110. Respiratory rate, 35. So I'm really worried about that. That's a high respiratory rate. And look at the SATs. 67% on room air, so this is a problem. And let's say it's right now in the middle of Joburg where everyone's got COVID. So X-ray, if you have a look at this, trachea central, that we're okay with. Lung field, so this looks like a hazy opacification that's throughout both lung fields. This looks pretty bad. Cardiothoracic ratio, maybe a little bit enlarged, but if you have a look, it says that it's supine mobile X-ray. So it's probably going to be an AP x-ray, not a PA x-ray. So you can't really comment on the cardiothoracic ratio. Diaphragms, those look okay. Extras, it uh, looks like you've got a little bit of artifact on the left-hand side. But you definitely got this patchy of pacification throughout both lung fields. And this is really typical of what we're seeing at Helen Joseph at the moment. The next x-ray is even more interesting. So let's say same patient three days later. What I want to know is what can you see on this x-ray? Hey, let me show you what we've got here and we'll talk through the x-ray as well. Um, I think most people are in agreement that this looks like an absolutely terrible x-ray. Um, this patient is really in trouble. We'll talk through what we can see. Okay. 
So stop sharing. Here we go. So trachea, is a trachea central? Yes, trachea looks nice and central there. But interestingly, you can see this bright white line in the middle. This patient's actually intubated. This patient's on a ventilator. I've had one question come through in the chat asking about intubation of COVID patients. I'll come back to that in a sec. Lung fields look just disastrous. There's this patch infiltrates bilaterally throughout both lung fields. Um, and again, this is typical of COVID. So we're seeing a lot of this in the emergency department. Circulation, that cardiothoracic ratio looks big. I think this is probably an AP chest X-ray. And if you think about the fact that the patient's gonna be on a ventilator, it makes sense that this patient's probably going to have the cassette put underneath them and that they're going to be X-rayed from the top down. It's going to be probably an anterior posterior chest X-ray. Diaphragms look all right. And then there's just loads of extras here. So you've got some ECG leads on there, the tracheas and uh, the, um, the patient's intubated. I can't actually see a nasogastric tube. That would be interesting. Um, but a couple of extras going on there. So the question is, um, what about intubating COVID patients? And I'll try and sum it up as quickly as I can, just for lack of time. Um, COVID patients, interestingly, tend to come in with low SATs and they often are awake and talking to you. It's been one of the challenges that we've really found is that usually in the emergency department before COVID, if you saw someone with SATs in the 70s or the 80s, those patients are sick, they're hypoxic, they're confused, they're often peri-arrest. And we would try and bring their oxygen levels up and if we couldn't, we would intubate them early. And they tended to do better if we caught them early and we intubated and we ventilated. COVID is really different. And we're finding that a lot of patients can manage quite well with low SATs. So we're seeing patients come in with the SATs in the 60s, 70s, 80s, who are awake and talking to us. Um, in which case, the evidence seems to be that tubing them has actually got quite a high mortality. And if you can get away without intubating them, they tend to do better. So here in the emergency department, we'll try them on a non-rebreather. If that doesn't work and bring their oxygen levels up, we would try maybe double oxygen, so nasal prongs and a non-rebreather. If that doesn't work, we would try non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal oxygen. So you need a ventilator to do that, but the oxygen that you're supplying sits on their face, not through an ET tube that you've intubated them. And they tend to do better with that than intubation. Um, so it's an interesting one in terms of what we would do that's very different to what we would normally be doing. Okay, um, so this patient, typical COVID x-ray, we're seeing a lot of these type of cases in the ED. And then last case, you've got a 45 year old female patient, she presents to the ED intoxicated, everyone comes into the ED intoxicated, not our staff incidentally, just the patients. And this patient looks like she's been stabbed, right posterior chest. Nice easy one, what's going on in this x-ray? Last poll, let me bring it up here. What can you see? Yes, all the answers are coming through correct. That's very hopeful. Most of the answers are coming through correct. Fantastic. Let me stop that there. We've all got more or less the right answer. Um, typical pneumothorax on the right hand side. I'll show you in a sec. There we go. So, can you see that you've got the lung collapse down here? Here's the lining of your lung. Your right lung is collapsed down. Typical pneumothorax. You've got no lung markings between the lung and the chest wall. Um, trachea, really difficult to see. Uh, exactly where the trachea is. To be honest, I can't quite work out what's going on. A couple of folks said, could this be pneumonia? I mean, obviously on the right-hand side, your patient's been stabbed, but interestingly on the left here, that lung field looks like there's a lot of pacification there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this patient's unlucky and got pneumonia as well on the left-hand side. It's not the greatest x-ray, but definitely a pneumothorax on the right-hand side. I can't wait to put in a chest strain on this patient. Okay. That has brought us to the end of our slideshow. I'll bring everyone up in a second, see if there's any questions. But just to recap, what we've gone through is <clears throat> basics in terms of is the x-ray a good enough x-ray that we want to be looking at it? 
And then we run through a nice systematic approach, airway, breathing, circulation, diaphragm, any extras. And then we've looked at a couple of examples. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna bring everyone up. And are there any questions from anyone? Um, hello, Doctor. Thank you so much for such an amazing presentation. It was a really good recap for me. Um, I'd just like to know, in terms of management of um, three test tubes, guys, I need to know if you guys can hear me. Chest tubes wants... for patients with, um, with tuberculosis. When I went to the clinic last year, the family physicians told us that they don't typically put in chest strains. They prefer to treat them with um, medication. Uh, can you just comment on that, please? Thank you. It's okay, so a really good question. Um, so just to recap, the question was, would you put in a chest drain? And there's two questions. Would you put in a chest drain for every patient who's got TB and a pneumothorax? Or would you put in chest drains ever for a patient who's got TB and a pneumothorax? So would you put in a chest drain ever? Yes. If you've got a big pneumothorax, you tend to find that that lung's not going to re-expand by itself. So a big, massive pneumothorax, even though the underlying cause is TB, Yes, I would put in a chest drain. But your worry with TB is that often you've got fibrotic changes and often you've got a loculated pneumothorax. So part of the lungs collapse down, but the rest of the lung is stuck and adherent to the side of the chest cavity. And the problem is, as you put in a chest drain, sometimes if the lung has fibrosed and stuck to the side, you can end up putting in the chest drain right into a bit of lung and you create a bronchopleural fistula. And that's a little bit more difficult to fix. So the trick is you want to pick which patients with a pneumothorax and TB you put in a chest drain on. If it's a massive pneumothorax, the whole thing is collapsed down, definitely stick in a chest drain. If you've got a loculated pneumothorax and some of the lung is still stuck to the side, you might put in a chest drain, but when you do, as you put it in, you want to do a nice good finger sweep and make sure that there's no fibrosis sticking to the side. If there's fibrosis everywhere, I wouldn't bother putting in a chest drain because you can do more harm than good with that patient. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. It sounded like there was another question coming through as well. Nope. Okay. Any more questions? Going once. Going twice. Nope. In that case, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. It's just after three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, which means that now would be a good time to go and have a gin and tonic if alcohol was on sale. Sadly, it's not. Um, enjoy the rest of your enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and thank you very much for your time today. What I'm going to suggest is that you just leave the meeting as and when you want, and I'll hang around here for five minutes just in case anyone else has got extra questions. Cheers, all. Dr. Lewis, I just want to say thank you so, so much. This has been an incredible, incredible experience. Just learning so much. It's really been amazing. Um, so pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. It's been fantastic. Um, we'll just be in contact later just to get a small gift to you to say thank you for the event. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure. You've really taught us a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much for organizing. It's absolutely been a pleasure. Hi, Dr. Lewis, uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can. Um, I just want to know, my laptop kind of uh, glitched out when you were speaking about the hyperinflation. Could you just uh, repeat what you said and the number of ribs? So normally if you've got a PA chest X-ray, you want to see nine to 10 ribs. That would be normal. If you can see down to rib 11, 12, then you've probably got hyperinflation. So you want to look for diaphragms. Your diaphragms should have a nice curved dome to them. And if you find that your diaphragms are really flattened down and you can see all the way down to rib 11 or 12, then you've got to worry. Then you think that this patient's probably hyperinflated. Okay, thank you so much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, hi, doctor. Um, I actually have a question that I asked earlier. Um, it had to do with the pacemaker. Yes. Uh, I don't... Yeah. yeah um, I just, because um, yesterday we had a lecture that showed a defibrillation pad and it looked the same for me. So I just wanted to understand how would you differentiate between the two? 
So your pacemaker usually looks more like a bit of a computer. If you have a look at that one, and I'll, uh, I wonder if I can bring it up again. Hang on, let me see if I can share it again and find it. There we go, share. Okay, hang on a sec, I'm just gonna bring it up. Here we go. Okay, so you'll find that with the pacemaker, you tend to have more, it looks more like a computer. There's more little bits inside it. The defibrillation pad is usually just a square pad. So you'll see that it's going to be bright white. They'll both be bright white, um, but the pad should just be a square. This one should usually looks a little bit more rounder, and usually it's got what looks like little bits of computer chip inside it. The pads you should have two on. So you should have, if you're defibrillating someone or you're pacing someone, you should have one that's kind of right um, anterior, just underneath your clavicle. And you should have one that's on the left, um, kind of over your, what would be the apex of your heart. You should have two. You'd find that the pacing one usually has a wire coming down off it that sits inside the right atrium. So you should see a wire coming out of it. Your pacing pads will tend to have wires going through to the machine. So you might see two wires, but it shouldn't end up going into the heart. So your, your pacemaker should have, look more like a computer, it should have a wire coming out of it that ends in the right atrium. Does that help? Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Pleasure. The question on here about um, AP and PA in terms of the scapula. Um, you tend to find that when you've got a PA view, your scapula just gets in the way. It's a little bit, you can see them a lot clearer if you've got a, sorry, if you've got an AP view, but it's not the, it's not the most important thing to notice. You tend to find that with an AP view, your cardiothoracic ratio is going to be bigger and you just don't have as nice clear lung fields. So scapula less important um, for that. Any other questions before I stop recording and log off? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Let me stop there.